Well, I grew up in the Foreign Service. My father was consul. Uh, his last post was to the Court of St. James in London. Uh, and uh, he joined the Foreign Service right after the war in Shanghai because he grew up in China. And then my mother went out to China uh, and joined the service around 48. They met, married, fell in love, or fell in love married, I suppose. And uh, that began my family's life, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yes, I mean, I know. Uh, for, now, times are very different now, but when I was growing up, when I was young, um, the, the wife, the diplomat's wife, was expected to carry out many duties over and above, you know, being uh, mother and, and wife and everything. No, my mother and many other constant wives often spoke of their being unpaid um, workers for the State Department, which of course they were. But also then as a daughter of the household, when you reached a certain age, it was expected that you would join in uh, the, the work of, oh, you know, the parties or support the embassy personnel in whatever way you could. I know, I was talking to Bill Hurd about that once. He wasn't really foreign service, but he grew, his, his father, his family had a connection. Um, I think, you know, after all these years of thinking about it, a lot of it has to do with the fact that you reinvent yourself post by post. So I spent, say, five years in Venezuela, and then I'm suddenly moving from South America to London, and with a new school, a new, well, not a new language, thankfully, there, but um, in any case, the idea is that you're so cut off from your background, from, you know, your previous friendships and situation, that you can become whoever you want, essentially, and I think that's been rather attractive to a lot of us. The education, absolutely. The schools that we went to, uh, both in Caracas, uh, we went to Campo Alegre, and in London, the American School in London, had the highest caliber of teachers. Um, there were 500 or more applicants for each position at ASL in London. Uh, so we had, we had wonderful schools, really exciting. Well, the fact that, you know, our friendships may only be two years, you know, one tour of duty. Uh, and then, again, it, it's, it, it's lack of continuity, I suppose. I mean, if you have a strong family, as we did, I don't think I felt deprived, you know. Although, no, you know, knowing a lot of people who have had friends since, since birth, practically, I imagine that's... That must be nice too, though I have no idea what it's like. I think that um, tackling other languages, well, no, I think that's a perk actually, not, not a downside. My father used to say that if you uh, have only one language, you have only one way of thinking. And I rather agree with that. I suppose some of the hardest parts uh, we're some, there was some real danger involved at times. In Venezuela once, we had, uh, we had a group in, in Venezuela called the FALN, the FALN. And they were um, an anti-American uh, group that would break into houses, Americans' houses and things. And usually they didn't really kill anybody, they just tied them all up and spray painted the walls and everything like that. But, Occasionally, they would arrange um, mobs outside the embassy, and I got caught up in one once when I was going to meet my father, and <sighs> that was pretty bad. I didn't like that at all at all, but that was very unusual. And they never got into, into your home or anything like that? Nope, nope. We had drills, Do you know, what to do if, uh, if somebody got in, but that never happened to us.
Well, you have to understand, I had no idea what a regular American child was. I never lived in the United States. I, was, I lived in Washington, D.C. when Dad was at state, uh, first and second grade. Uh, but that's all. So I have no idea what growing up in America is like. Oh, and Cuba was very frightening, actually. I was four, but I had started pre-primaria. I had started kindergarten, I guess you'd say. And, uh, and my older brother and sister were, were all at this school. That was essentially all Spanish, I don't believe, because I just remember, you know, always being told that I didn't have the right word and I wasn't listening well enough. In, in fact, I was just trying to learn Spanish as we went along. But after uh, Castro took over and the relations between the United States and, and Cuba became so deteriorated to such an extent, then um, the, our servant was you know, told to leave uh, or endanger her family. We had these beautiful big dogs, wine ramas, and they threw poison over the walls and the, we found the dogs, you know, dead in the garden in the morning. And I think the funniest thing I remember was that when you would pick up the phone while it was connecting, you would dial and while it was connecting, my mother told me that there was a tape that would run about Castro is the greatest, Castro is our savior, Castro. And I can remember walking to the living room and having my mother screaming into the phone, the hell with Castro, you know. On and on, which is kind of exciting for a kid. Yeah, we were in town. My my dad and my mom, and another foreign service couple were outside the valley at uh, a dinner party. Caracas is is a long, narrow valley, only about two of some miles wide and about twelve long. So they were uh, off the fault line, which runs right down the center of the. Of the um, of the valley, yeah, it was it, it was a very bad quake, and my sister was babysitting in an apartment building, and she couldn't carry one of the one of the kids had on uh, a cast had a broken leg, she couldn't carry uh, him down the stairs. So in any case, my my two brothers and myself were at home, watching the walls crack open watching the car in the driveway go down into the street, you know, and start to go down the hill. Um, and the noise, uh, an earthquake is like planes and trains and everything all at once. It's just an overwhelming noise. Anyway, so the, my, my father and the man he was with jumped in the car, drove back into town, got to the apartment building, you know, got up there and got my sister and the kids out there and the next day in an aftershock that building went down so that was a baddie very much to serve americans he was you know, as a consular a consul in the consulate section so mostly we dealt with uh we i worked in the embassy a couple of summers in london um with visas with aid you know aid um uh, passports, oh, the services to American citizens abroad is essentially. So I can buy, remember my father getting a phone call and having to leave Thanksgiving dinner because an American had landed in jail or something like that, you know, and he, he would go to usually bring him home. <laughs> kind of interesting. It was something he believed very, very strongly in. Um, and, and I agree, the, the idea that a public service, a public servant, now it seems as though people take that as someone who hasn't made it in the private sector, that's not how we felt or how we thought about it. It really was an honorable job to serve, to serve our country in this way. No, I don't think I was very aware of that. You know.
I actually have a memory of my father saying to me, you know, um, everything you do will reflect on your country. And I was like, what? You know, uh, people are going to think that the whole, our whole country is like me if I do something. Maybe, oh, it was a terrible feeling of self-consciousness and responsibility. And it wasn't, it was too heavy for a child. I do not recommend it. I tell you, I think that that idea was almost too big too, although it was something we were aware of. I'll tell you the, the, the best thing, the very best thing, was when I was, you know, by the time I got into high school and we were posted to London, I could travel in the continent. I could, you know, go jump on a train and get over to Amsterdam or, you know, wherever. I went to Russia once and through all the communist countries and I can remember thinking that all I had to do was get to a phone and get hold of the American embassy and wherever I was in the world and whatever situation I was in, um, they would get my father and he would get me out. And that was an extraordinary sense of security and safety. Well, really only the treatment of women. Uh, and as I say, I know that this has changed a great deal in this last generation. But when I was young and my mother and her, you know, fellow, fellow wives, uh, it was great exploitation. It, it truly was. They worked their butts off for only because it was expected to support the officer, you know. But it wasn't given any recognition. Yeah, it seems like it was a lot slower to change than, than the rest of the country. The only other thing, and I'm not sure, I think I'd have to check my facts more on this. But as I recall, my father died very suddenly when, I was, when we were in London. And we had 30 days to wrap up our business and, and get back to the United States. And not having lived in the United States for so many years, we had no home in the United States. So we went to my mother's parents uh, in Missouri, which was probably the greatest culture shock I ever had. But I understood uh, my mother to say once she was terribly, terribly upset one night and that she had learned that my father's pension was cut in half because the officer was, was dead. Uh -huh. Leaving a, a woman who had not worked in many years with four children. Now I hope that has changed.